everyone, welcome to today's live event hosted by 360 Learning and Mass Marketing on how to leverage marketing in L&D to boost performance and impact. So we'll just give people half a minute or so um, to join just before we get started. Uh, in the meantime, if you'd like to share in the chat window uh, where you're joining from, which organization, team you're with, we'd love to hear from you. Um, David, where are you calling in from today, Ash and Ashley? So I'm uh, calling in from West Sussex, sunny West Sussex, so the south of England. Back you, Ashley. Very nice. Uh, I'm actually really north, so I'm in the northeast uh, in a place called Middlesbrough, not too far from Newcastle. We miraculously oh, also have sun. <laughs> Got anyone in the in, in the chat yet? Hi Valerie, calling in from home in Essex. And Christian in Germany. Hello. Hi, Kerry in West London. Yes, Lizzie, Lee, representing so. the Northeast. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll kick things off now. So, my name is Freddie. I'm the content lead um, for the UK here at 360 Learning. I'm going to be hosting the session today. Um, so just a couple of things on housekeeping first before we get started. So um, you will receive some replay links for the session um, after and those are going to be available to you at any time. Um, as you can see, there are kind of various sections on your screen. So I'll just take a moment to just to go through these, to go through these with you now. Um, so feel free to play around the sections. You can move them around, make the slides bigger or smaller uh, or minimize certain areas um, if you want to. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the questions tab. So we will be doing Q and A at the end. So feel free to submit your questions uh, as we go, and David and Ashley uh, will answer those at the end. Um, you'll also find some other relevant resources on the left-hand side, um, and at the bottom of the screen there, you can see the smiley face. That's the reactions button. So you know if you like the like the content, you agree or disagree or whatever, um, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and just a quick note as well to, to tell you about our upcoming webinar on uh, the new area, uh, new era of AI happening on June 27th. So uh, if you're around for that, we'd love to see from you. We'd love to hear from you as well there. Uh, we're also going to be running some polls during the session. So these are going to appear throughout the presentation as well. Um, so please submit your answers and we go. And uh, to introduce our lovely speakers today then, we've got David James, CLO at 360 Learning. Hi, David. Hi, hi, Freddie. Hello, uh, and Ashley Sinker, Managing Director from Mass Marketing. Ashley, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Great. Um, okay, so let's get started. So just jumping into our kind of topics of the day that we're going to discuss. Um, first up, Ashley and David are going to talk about the engagement challenges that L&D teams um, face, and we'll see if this kind of resonates with you all in the audience as well, some of the challenges that you're facing. Um, and then we're going to talk about why understanding your audience, understanding your learner personas, and really going beyond just job titles um, is so important in this marketing approach uh, to L&D. Um, Ashley and David are then going to give us some marketing tactics and strategies to boost impact and performance. Um, and then we'll jump into a discussion around how to really prove the, the value in L&D, how to influence um, and persuade your audience as well. And lastly, uh, you know, how to actually measure this, measure success with this marketing approach. Um, so jumping into the first topic around challenges in L&D then, and I think this is a really good um, opportunity to ask you all about the challenges that you're currently facing today um, in your role. So is it around limited resources and budget, learner engagement, uh, a lack of understanding of gaps in performance, lack of data insights, uh, maybe it's limited support from the leadership team um, and one that's always popular in L&D, measuring the impact um, of your training programs. So we've got a poll here on the screen. Um, if you can kind of just submit submit your answers, submit which challenges um, you're facing, then we can have a look at those. Okay. 
Okay, so we've got quite a, a very good, I think we're just still getting some people uh, adding in their responses. If it's none of these challenges, feel free to add any others um, in the chat and we can talk about those as well. Okay, cool. So let's have a look. Um, so learner engagement, it's up there, 50%. Um, measuring impact, 30% as well. So that bodes well for the topic that we're talking about today. Um, and, and just, okay, so going on to that kind of learner engagement piece then, um, I think maybe we can start off the, the discussion there because it, the, it is one of the major ones. Um, yeah, David, if we could kick things off, what are some of the challenges facing L&D teams when it comes to engagement specifically? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and then we can pass over to Ashley. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Freddie. Um, I've been really looking forward to this conversation uh, uh, with Ashley because uh, for a long time now, I felt that there's plenty that we could learn from marketing with regard to engagement because I've been in learning and development since the late 1990s and uh, a lack of engagement has been a common thread. We kind of think, I mean, we tell ourselves a lot that with time being squeezed uh, ever more, that people have uh, less time to engage. And if they had more time, then they would engage with us. But the bad news is, is that um, whether there's more time or not, we're still competing for attention, for things that people choose to engage with themselves and where they see their value. So, for, so the, I suppose the bad news is, is that, uh, that learning and development has struggled with engagement uh, in learning and development uh, going back. Uh, to, uh, to my days when face-to-face -face was the, the predominant uh, mode of, uh, of, of engagement. And then through to uh, online and digital, uh, which of course is to a great extent the only opportunity that we can uh, both engage and influence our organizations at scale. So if you don't have engagement, it is a key indicator that something's wrong. And I don't think that it's all around uh, people not having time. But the good news is, is that there are plenty of different things that we could experiment with to see whether we can improve engagement. Um, and this, this is, I think, is where it's really exciting to, to be considering the lessons that, that marketing and digital marketing have learned in the last, um, well, how long is it now, actually, 20 years? Um, I'd say that, uh, that it, it's probably been, been the case since, uh, since digital marketing was, uh, was, was perhaps um, uh, became mainstream. Uh, yeah. I do remember uh, when, uh, when I was at Disney, there were, there were these, uh, these two fellas uh, in digital marketing and this huge army of, uh, of, of normal marketers. And that was in 2007, 2008. Uh, and it was it just, I used to think it was hilarious two people and they sat in an office they shared an office together uh, and of course they they were sitting there going why people why don't people understand us uh, and of course by the time i left in 2014 pretty much everything is uh, is digital but but yeah you were going you were going to say actually no i i mean i think the marketing has experienced such a drastic change or we've been forced to change really because of the advent of the internet and you know we have no choice but to adjust and adapt and you know this l and is kind of going through that same process now and that evolution i think is a lot slower because we're governed by organizations rather than people or consumers which does kind of impact because we're we're constantly motivated by business objectives rather than the individual's objective and i'll touch on that later how that's sometimes problematic um but you know it's funny that you mentioned the time piece because whenever we kick off a marketing for learning project that that's always brought up always like my learners don't have time nobody has time to learn I hear that every every single day pretty much and the reality is we all have the same amount of time in the day people have time and they make time for things that they deem important or valuable so really the major issue that L&D has when it comes to engagement is well twofold one is that a huge amount of the employee base actually just doesn't even know that learning exists, i.e. where to go, what it is, what's available to them. You'd be surprised how many learners I speak to that don't even know the full kind of learning proposition that's available to them at an organization. And secondly, back to that time piece, they don't actually 
understand there's no perceived value when it comes to learning. So they aren't ever going to carve out time for learning. Our expectation as L&D is, is that people should want to learn. They work here. Of course, we've invested so much time and energy. Everybody wants to learn. They don't. And until we kind of start to actually understand that that marketing mindset, that it's it's down to us to influence, it's down to us to persuade, we've got to go meet them where they are, we'll never solve our tech problem. Um, sorry, we'll never solve our engagement problems with more tech or you know different learning solutions. If the root cause of our issues is awareness and a lack of perceived value, then you know that's where we need to focus and marketing can really, really help with that. Ashley, I think you've you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there that I think is um is is a massive Achilles heel and a blind spot for learning and development. That uh, again, ever since I've been in the profession, we've we've sought the self-directed learner. If only we could empower them, then they would then develop themselves, because after all, it's their responsibility. So what we've done, and there are two key words here, we've delivered learning and we've provided learning. And we think that's our job. Yep. That all we need to do is deliver it and provide it. But you've absolutely hit the nail on the head that the reason that this does not work and has not worked is that we've not entered their world to try to influence them in a way that they both care about and they acknowledge is where they need to go. We've kind of stood from the outside and said, well, there's plenty in the LMS. Well, if only you'd listened on the course. But, but, but that, you know, the, trying to take the moral high ground there has prevented us from truly understanding that if we want to engage, and this is where I think marketing really, uh, really can help, that if we understand from an L&D perspective what it is that they're expected to do and what they can't do easily or effectively, then we can help develop brand loyalty in the same way as marketers would to an external brand. But remember, they've got skin in the game. They work for this brand that you're trying yeah. to engender brand loyalty to. And then in the same way as digital marketing helps to, if it can recognize where you are in, say, a buying uh, journey or a, um, a buying cycle, then you just latch on and you help them to do what they're trying to do, but better without you. Again, there are so many ways in which we can capitalize this, but it, it will never, ever, ever work if we keep on standing from the outside and try to create more engaging learning, thinking mm -hmm. that that is interactivity, new and modern ways of, uh, of, of interacting or delivering this content. It's almost as if we need to get close to them in their world in order to be able to influence them uh, and then educate them uh, from, uh, from there. Exactly. And and I think we we tend to conflate our understanding of a learner's need from a learning perspective with their need from a marketing perspective. So, for example, I know we're going to talk about personas in a bit. I often see people who have developed personas and they focus on learning needs all the time. So, well, they need this. They need this to do their job. But that's that's all good and well when we're, you know, creating cool stuff from a learning perspective and, you know, helping our LXDs to you know, develop stuff that's groundbreaking and innovative and all that lovely stuff that's really important from a learning perspective, but that we can't use that same thinking when we're trying to do marketing to these people because it, it's not the same thing. And we, we can't get in their shoes. We can't answer the what's in it for me. We can't deeply understand their emotional drivers and the things that are actually going to motivate them to actually learn, commit time to learning, build habits with learning change their performance, improve business impact, all of that stuff, that cascade that we want to happen. We can't do that if we don't know who they are. Absolutely. I think that's probably a, a, a nice, he's nicely the, the next topic there. So, um, Ashley, if you want to go first, just kind of expanding on that point, why is it so important to understand your audience and really go beyond those job titles when you're kind of creating learner personas? Yeah, so I mean, the, the root of the root of it really is primarily what I just said, which is if we are just looking at people from a job title perspective, i.e. they come to work and they do this job, so they need this learning, it's that is never going to motivate somebody. Like that, that, that is not an evocative statement. You can't make that interesting for people. There is no resonance there. Just because someone is in a leadership position versus someone who's kind of, you know, you're, you're more kind of apron wearers in a retail environment or something, 
doesn't mean that they're going to be motivated by different things or the same thing. So it, we need to take the time to actually understand who these people are. What gets them up in the morning? Why are they at work? You know, some people are motivated by career progression, increases in salary. Other people are coming to work because they want to support their families. Other people really want to progress their careers outside of the organization that they work in. These are all really important motivators that are deeply connected to learning. But if we're just continuously using learning initiatives as the marketing message, it's problematic because it doesn't connect with people. We completely miss them. Oh, actually, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. Um, that you know, if I, if I can only build on that, because uh, you know, you, uh, you you've almost said exactly what what I'd say there. That, but a, but a couple of things. Number one, uh, I think what you've highlighted there is the problem cycle we've just entered with skills. That, uh, that every LMS now will tag content to skills, align skills to, to job titles, and boom, this time we'll crack it. But let me tell you, kids, I was there when they were called behaviors before and competencies before that. It just been rebranded because it didn't work before. Um, so, so that's one thing to, uh, um, uh, to, to be wary of. But the, but the other one is that we've got to be with people when they need us as well, when and where they need us. Now, the biggest opportunity that we face with employees is during periods of transition, when they need our help. Their eyes and minds are wide open to, crikey, this is all new to me, what do I do? Like, so often we're not there. Uh, that is as people transition through our organizations into new teams, new roles, new responsibilities, or in periods of enforced adaptation where things uh, uh, are changing in the organization and then people need guidance not just a headline not just a cursory course or relearning but the guidance and support that they need in order to be successful al aligned there to the, the culture of the company so everything that, that answers the, co the question or comes from the question how do I get the right things done here not removed it not buying a new exhaustive um, uh, suite of content uh, that, uh, that that people plug into, and then, then you know there must be something for everybody because it's because it's so exhaustive. Uh, without the context, then a lot of the time things are going to go awry. And look, there's another indicator that what you're providing isn't hitting the mark. If people aren't engaging, could be that people don't see enough of the value in their everyday job. I know that Guy Wallace shares so much on uh, on LinkedIn. He's uh, 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 to say that that he's lived through what we that we what we have done, and uh, and his mentors uh, that were around in the uh, the 60s and 70s did laid a lot of the uh, the groundwork for uh, for what we're we're still talking about and trying to address now. But he he put up a statistic, and uh, uh, apologies, I don't have the uh, uh, the reference now, but he does. You know, but I'd say follow him. He said that uh, that, that a study's done that only 15% of people can. Um, can apply a generic content to the context of their job. You're really thinking, my God, like that's that's bonkers. And yet we rely so heavily on generic stuff and marketing our generic stuff. And going back to what we were saying before, if only people went to the LMS, they'd see all of the value. And again, it goes back to if we don't understand our audience, how on earth can we provide a solution? And therefore, we should be looking at the lack of engagement as a key indicator that something is not working. Yeah. And I think as well, getting people to the LMS is one step, right? You know, I just put something on LinkedIn yesterday around marketing's hierarchy of needs, right? So, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I built one for marketing for learning because we can't put the horse before the cart here, right? So it's all good and well saying we need to get everybody to the LMS. But if if the experience that they have is really crap when they get there, you know, again, we do a lot of discovery. I speak to a lot of learners. A lot of people get really lost in complex LXPs or learning solutions and learning platforms that aren't really built for them in any way, shape or form. So they kind of land there. And they're just absolutely stymied. You know, it's the equivalent of going on Netflix to watch something and scrolling for 15 minutes because you can't decide on something because it's, you know, a freaking candy shop of options. So, you know, a lot of people, we need to make sure that we've got a really robust learning experience first before we, we really focus on strategic marketing. That doesn't mean that comms isn't going to be important for us, but we're never going to be able to move the needle with our marketing initiatives if the product that we're selling, i.e. our learning Not sure if uh, if it's just me that's lost Ashley. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was that all frozen, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, maybe 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 Ashley's just frozen a moment. Yes, we have lost Ashley. 
Should we go to the next question, Freddie? Yeah, and then, uh, then catch Ashley in a moment. Yeah, sounds good. Um, okay, so how can we kind of, when we're talking about impact and performance, how can we use marketing uh, tactics and strategies uh, to boost to boost that performance and impact? So, David, yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to start, and then hopefully Ashley can come back and uh, share her thoughts as well. Yeah, I think we've got Ashley oh, back just in are. time. I am. It's my internet really likes to um, drop off at critical things when I'm doing live recordings and the such like, so I often have to tether to my phone. Got to love technology. <laughs> it's all right. You had an anticipation to the, uh, the experience. Did <laughs> yeah. I leave you guys on a cliffhanger? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, so, yeah, uh, uh, David, if you want to kind of take this one first and then we can hear from Oh, no, you Ashley's come back just in, in time. I think that, yeah, uh, that I, I feel like a fraud if I were talking marketing strategies with, uh, with Ashley here. <laughs> so what are we looking at? How, you, how, you, how can you get the impact and performance you want using marketing tactics and strategies? So I think sometimes, again, the concept of marketing and marketing in our L&D functions, it, it's, it's such a big topic, right? So oftentimes when we're speaking to clients and we're having conversations, it's almost like, where do you start? Where, what, what actually is, is kind of going to be, help you move the needle. So there's kind of like low hanging fruit areas for us. And there's the kind of more strategic view as well. So key areas that I think will get really kind of immediate or very quick impact are a couple of things. One is improving your copywriting skills. Um, we don't often see a lot of energy being put into writing compelling copy when it comes to our comms, whether that's on our social platforms, teams, Yammer, the such like, or even our course descriptions and our LMSs. These are overlooked areas and opportunities for us to more effectively communicate with our audiences. I can't describe how many dry, difficult emails I've seen in my time where it's like, go and check out this new piece of learning on your LMS or, you know, these are missed opportunities. So that, you know, that's a really easy skill. There's tons of resources online to build up copywriting capabilities. But that's something that I think if we're looking at a toolkit for L&D in terms of marketing skills, copywriting for me is a really big one and probably the biggest of all. But really what we want to think about is, you know, what what is impact, right? So if we're looking at, well, how do I get impact from marketing? I always ask my clients, what are we actually trying to achieve? Like, wh what what is the goal here? Because, for example, some people want to ha change their learning cultures. Engagement might be part of that. But th that's a, it's quite a difficult question to answer specifically what impact we want. But ultimately, what we see with our clients when we develop more strategic long-term learning campaigns that focus on consistent communications over multiple channels over a period of time, I'm talking, you know, somewhere between six and 18 months, we do see significant and drastic impacts in even things like logins to the LMS, number of courses taken, again, whatever KPIs are interesting and, and useful for you as a, a learning function is, is what we should be measuring against. Um, but we should be getting kind of two different types of impact from a marketing perspective, right? We should be getting increased engagement with our marketing efforts, more email opens, more, you know, more logins to the LMS, that sort of thing. But we ideally want to then be connecting that to learning impact, right? So is the learning that is being done as a consequence of our marketing actually achieving the goals that we want to? So marketing's again, that kind of first piece, like we can't affect the, the learning proposition in a lot of our clients, we can affect the marketing piece only really. It's a bit of a politician's answer, isn't it? It's kind of a, how long's a piece of string? I haven't really answered that. <laughs> well, if I can add, actually, I think that there's uh, there's, there's some other stuff uh, on top of that. Now, I was learning in development and then became a marketer, so uh, so so I see it from that from the other perspective. And seeing seeing a marketer's goal a lot of the time is to get people to buy stuff eventually, yep. and I think that's harder than learn, doing learning and development because learning and development are just trying to get people to do the job that they've been employed to do in the way that's expected. Now, a lot of the time, people will, will, will have to fumble along and figure out how to do that job because they don't have the, the, the predictable, reliable guidance and support. Now, learning and development might say, yeah, but that's down to the, uh, to the line manager. Uh, but for me, that only goes so far that, that if we are in organizations is to equip people to do the job that they're employed for today and then help the organization to shore itself up tomorrow by ensuring that there's a talent pipeline for the short term, mid term 
uh, perhaps a bit, it's a bit much to say the longer term future. But that's why we're there, not to provide content and deliver courses. So if we were going to do that, from, if a marketer came into learning and development and saw these problems, we'd probably see there's a really good opportunity to create a funnel here and create a funnel that yep. picks people up from where they are, which is they join the organization and they don't know the, uh, the culture. And yet everybody else uh, who's been there for any amount of time understands when they butt up against the culture, how to get the right stuff done. Uh, the, the forms of communication, how to raise the profile, how to develop some currency, how to get some support for your ideas, how to get uh, increase your resources in order to do so. You know, all of this stuff that you only know when you work there. So guide and support people to go and do that. Don't shove it at them in the first afternoon that they're there, buy them full of coffee and, you know, expect that uh, once they've done the compliance training that they'll, they'll then have enough support. There's so much, if, if marketing did that, I mean, you'd be booted out of the business. Sales would never talk to you again. Um, but but yep. there is so much, but, that, but it goes back to what you said. If you're clear on the goal, when, when you've got new starters, just be clear on your goal. And it's not engagement, it's not consistent. It's, it is uh, that people are staying beyond six months. It's a ridiculous figure. It's something like a third or, or a quarter of people who join an organization leave uh, in the first nine months. Now, that's a ludicrous yeah. amount of waste. Just solve that problem. You've got first line managers that are probably the biggest risk to your organization. Uh, if they've been promoted, they're now in charge of people. And so they've got to uh, make sure that, they, that they're delivering uh, the, at least the amount that, uh, that, that six, seven, no matter uh, how many people are, uh, are employed to do those jobs. And then make sure the top talent doesn't just stay, but is actually prepared for future roles. There's so much that we could be getting out our head around. And what we've got to remember as well is that, that the emphasis now on skills isn't just so we can go, well, look at our organization. We've got all the skills we need. It's so people do something with that. So what is it that you want to do? It's probably that those people are then plugging skills gaps in your organization. So how do you know that they are actually plugging those skills gaps? Uh, you know, but, but again, too many people are, uh, are figure, trying to scratch their head and say, well, you know, we bought this skills machine and, and no one's using it. And so they're trying to solve the engagement problem rather than the, the skills problem. But again, because like, they don't so, know it exists, David. <laughs> 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 but again, but like if you put a marketer in charge of this, it'll be goal oriented. You'll be running sh uh, short experiments. You wouldn't have bought the uh, the solution before you understood the problem, uh, and then you'll be uh, A B testing to see whether uh, see whether you can make a uh, a difference or not to uh, a, a proportion of that group, rather than just providing content and say and then thinking, well, the buyer doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, and you know, this is kind of why I started Mass because I worked vendor side for a long time. I was, you know, went from marketing coordinator all up, all the way up to CMO. And in that time, you know, selling learning platforms, e-learning, and I just used to, it used to boggle me that we weren't ever, L&D functions weren't really ever held accountable for the budget they're spending. <laughs> We're still very much seen as a kind of operational resource or a cost center, some a necessary aspect to the business. And it kind of puts us in a really interesting box where, we haven't felt the need to evidence our success and prove our value, but that is shifting now. Conversations are leaning much more into the EVP and the role that L&D plays within that. And I think this is a really big opportunity for us to pivot, change the lens a little bit, and actually you know, really understand who we are as a learning brand, because a lot of times, that is just not understood. You know, we do a lot of things, something called a value proposition canvas with a lot of our customers because it forces you to reflect on what it is that you actually offer to your people and what your people want and need. And hopefully in some beautiful, sexy Venn diagram, there's, there's some overlap there and you can start to identify your marketing messages and more deeply understand, you know, what is it that people are wanting? You know, the example you gave of, you know, someone who's starting the business versus a, you know, a manager or maybe someone who's newly promoted to a leadership role, just think about the way you might communicate to those two people differently. Someone who knows absolutely nothing about the business, the types of communications that they might need, you know, a bit of spoon feeding, a lot of hand holding, very, you know, warm embrace and the such like, you know, whereas people who've been there a while, you can talk to them differently. They're in with the culture, they get the lingo. You know, this is all really important stuff and why we need to take the time to understand our audiences, mm. but also understand who we are because we can't communicate that to anyone if we don't know that, and I don't think we take the time to really deeply understand our own value proposition, so we can't communicate it. Absolutely, and I think that leads nicely to, to a question that we uh, like to ask the audience. So when we are kind of uh, thinking about understanding our audience and, and when we kind of do that analysis in our organization, 
Um, so do you do you seek learning needs or do you seek uh, performance needs or is it a combination of both? So, um, yeah, I'd love, love to hear from the audience on, on this one. Is it up on the screen? Because I can't see it. I'm still stuck on the job title slide. Ah, um, it's up I on my see, screen. I wonder. I can yeah. see the, uh, the poll. Okay, must be. <laughs> I'm just having tech issues very clearly. <laughs> Just waiting for some more responses to come in. Lots going on in the, in the chat here. Lots of people taking notes. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we've just got just over half the people responded. I just wait. 10 seconds more. Okay, great. So we can move on. So let's see. Uh, so it looks like it's a combination um, of, of both with more so looking for performance needs. So yeah, that's, uh, that's great to hear. So let's move on to the next discussion then, um, which leads in nicely. I think yeah, how can we how can we prove our value and get learners to actually make time for learning? And I know we've already spoke um, about this in a, in a bit of detail. So, yeah, David, if you want to share your thoughts first, and then we can uh, hear from Ashley. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So I'll reiterate what uh, what I mentioned earlier um, that that it's it's no secret here. Um, the the very noisy vendor market might tell you. Uh, that you'll get people to make more time for learning by implementing a new and novel uh, interactive way of delivering the content, but it's just not true. Uh, I've been in this uh, profession nearly 25 years and I've seen too many promises of that, but it's really easy. You help people with what they're trying to do when they need the help, when and where they need the help, and that is it. Um, you have uh, the Learning and Development Department has a huge um, advantage over Google, YouTube, even ChatGPT, uh, which is you understand the culture in which people are expected to form. Um, now, my experience of running learning and development departments, uh, especially when I was at Disney, because when people joined Disney, they wanted to stay at Disney. People never asked me the technical questions. People asked me, how, the, how do you do this here? How do you do that here? What kind of presentations land here? How do I engage an executive uh, audience here and it was always very very specific so if you can be there and this is just to, to quote uh, Bob Mosher and Conrad Gofferson if you can be there at the moment of need you have an opportunity uh, to influence the moment of apply the moment that they apply the the, um, the 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 content or the core of your message or or your solution and this is where digital can help better than uh, than face to face because if you understand the challenges that people face when they butt up against your culture uh, ideally for the first time so this is during periods of assimilation but not exclusively uh, then you're able to provide guidance and support uh, but you will only do that if you understand the problems that people are facing and so uh, analysis is something that is uh, is, is, is perhaps um, not as in-depth as it could and should be in learning and development, but we do have the tools now that mean that we don't need to spend our time in design, development, and delivery uh, in the, the same way as we used to. So if we spend more time in analysis then uh, and experimentation, then we will be able to prove our value because we're solving the problems of uh, the people that uh, they're expected to perform uh, and uh, we will see that uh, that we're making number one there's an indicator that they will engage uh, and number two their engagement has led to the behavior and the outcomes uh, that were determined during analysis ashley would you would you uh, add anything to that yeah i mean i think the the learning at the point of need is uh, you know there's very few occasions where i've actually seen it really be that if like be that well implemented that uh lnd is almost invisible uh, you know i i don't know if that makes us extinct or really 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 good at our jobs um but you know the idea and the notion that you know we need to be exactly where people are i i don't entirely disagree with it but i think you know from from my perspective the purpose of marketing is to keep your product front of mind Right. So we're, we're not ideally trying, you know, their end goal is, of course, to sell products. But 
we know that everybody's not going to buy our product every single day. So we need to keep front of mind and we need to be more visible and more present so that when they do have a need or they, they have a requirement for something or they have a desire for something, we're what they think of. So to, to my mind, you know, the, the learning proposition needs to be robust. As I said, you know, if, if we are putting the horse before the car and we've got great marketing, but no, no learning to back it up or no quality learning, then it's still going to fall by the wayside. So what we really need to think about is how can we consistently present our value to our audiences? And I'll get on to how we can actually prove our value in a second. But that consistency piece is the biggest part of all if we want to convince people and persuade them to make time for learning they need to know you exist they need to be constantly reminded of the fact that you exist because people forget they forget really really easily you know the marketing's rule of seven that someone needs to see something seven times before they'll even recall that they've even seen it um you know that's been around since the 20s and hollywood advertising i think it's probably more now because we are inundated with advertising and social noise and the internet in general so that consistency piece is is the biggest part for me. The learning proposition that sits underneath it, it needs to be meaningful. It needs to be relevant. It needs to be useful for the person because otherwise they're they're not going to continue to engage no matter how great your marketing is. In terms of how we actually persuade and influence them, how do we prove our value? I think that value proposition piece is really, really a good starting point in terms of actually more deeply understanding what we offer, what that means to people. And then we need to take the time to understand who our audiences are, building out learner personas, actually taking the time to understand their emotional drivers and, and the challenges that they have and where learning meets those challenges and effectively communicate them consistently over a period of time. You know, ultimately, these things don't happen overnight. You know, we don't, marketing doesn't get results overnight. We talk to people sometimes who are like, I want leads tomorrow. And I'm like, I won't work with you because that's not realistic. You know, we can't magic up persuasion. We can't make people change their minds overnight. Influence and, and, and changes in behavior and changes in habits is really hard. So we have to kind of take the time to understand what it is that we're trying to communicate, really be very clear on the red threads that unite our learning brand and make sure that those sit within our comms and within our campaign efforts so that we are constantly keeping front of mind and positioning ourselves as the learning option of choice amidst a learning platform, Google, YouTube, and the such like. Absolutely. And I, and I think we've, uh, Ashley, you've kind of gone ahead, gone into, um, in, into this question as well. So we've already mentioned it here, but, um, yeah, maybe David, you could give us some of your thoughts on how we can influence and uh, persuade mm. audiences to engage in learning as well. Yeah, so so a lot of this came out in the uh, the research that we did last year. We did a report, uh, and we uh, uh, I think we went out. Was it uh, three thousand, Freddie? You'll know three thousand thousand respondents across US, yeah. UK, France, and Germany, uh, and they told us that they would learn more uh, if it was integrated into the work. So. Uh, because they are used to Googling and YouTubing, uh, but they said that they wouldn't find any other time. And they also told us the biggest blocker was generic content that didn't actually speak to the job that they were doing. So, you know, that's a, it was a huge sample size. And I think what that speaks to is learning and development have got one buying habit and your audience is over there screaming with their lack of engagement. And of course, with a survey like that, that they want help with the jobs that they're doing and improve the prospects at that organization. Um, they couldn't care less about learning and development. Uh, learning and development is a brand that is almost doing what it wants to do, but they are, they are really clear that they want to be able to do the job better and faster and improve their prospects. And the, the only way you could do that is by, is by helping them. But as I said, they, they, they told us loud and clear that, and it was two thirds of, uh, of all respondents, I think about 64% of individuals said uh, that they, the only way they would find more time for learning and development if it was actually integrated into their work. So I think there are lessons in there. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, even with, even with, if we were to integrate it into work, they still, they still might not be particular. It, I think it would actually help with point of need. So I, I have something I, I need to answer a question immediately, or there's something very organizationally specific. If that if it's embedded in the workflow like that, I can I can absolutely see how learning would increase as a consequence of that, mm. um, or at least uh, consumption of learning, whether knowledge acquisition occurs, I think is a separate conversation. 
I, from my perspective, you know, if we're, if we're going to un unpick marketing tactics in terms of how we actually influence and persuade, like I said, that consistency piece is really, really important. Another thing that we really overlook apart from copywriting is good design. You know, we don't really take the time to understand how the visuals that we use can also communicate something to our audiences. So, you know, these are, these are really simple things, but again, what unites your imagery? I'll often ask our clients, you know, show me some of the stuff that you're doing from a comms perspective at the moment. And there's, there's just nothing that unifies it. There's absolutely nothing that, you know, you wouldn't look at it as a job lot of stuff and think that was a campaign or that was, that all came from the same function. Whereas, you know, could you imagine Coca-Cola or, innocent smoothies or Netflix doing any marketing campaigns that don't look like those brands created them. And whilst those are kind of big ticket ideas and big businesses who have huge marketing budgets, the application is still the same. You know, we need, we need to be much clearer to people who we are and be use that consistency, not only in the frequency of our comms, but also the copywriting that sits within it, the value proposition that sits within it, you know, the, our value pillars, even down to our tone of voice. <laughs> You know, I think we'd all do well to drop the uh, casual corporate, as I like to call it, and be a little bit more human in how we interact with our people. We know that there's appetite for that. They just want to be treated like human beings. You know, they're not learners. In their heads, they don't come to work and think, I got to learn today. Like, they got, Ugh. bloody hell, my kid woke me up at 4 o'clock this morning. I've got to get the dog walked, and I've got, like, 3,000 meetings to do, but I've also got a huge amount of work. This is what's going on in their heads. So how do we identify, how do we relate to them with those challenges, you know, that's how we influence. That's how we persuade. We go where they are. We don't ask them to come to us. And that's what we do at the moment. We expect them to come to us with our comms and the way that we try and relate with people, whereas actually we need to completely forget the learning lens and focus much more on who are these people as people, what problems are they trying to solve and where does our learning meet that? Absolutely. And, um, and I think we've touched on this already. So just kind of wrapping this um, all up. So how do we actually measure the success with a marketing approach? Maybe Ashley, you want to take this one first? Yeah. So as I said, please, well, two, two things if you're going to do marketing stuff. One, benchmark. So actually draw a line in the sand. How do we know where we've got to if we don't know where we started from? You know, I urge you to benchmark, embrace data. It is your friend, even if you think it's going to make you look really terrible. It gives you insights. It gives you opportunities to iterate and learn more about your audience's behaviors and reactions to the efforts that you're making. As David's already alluded to, testing is really like a fundamental part of mark to, uh, the marketer's toolbook, I guess. And, and we don't do it a lot in L&D. So if you've, if you've identified what it is that you're trying to achieve with a learning campaign, for example, benchmark against KPIs that align with that goal. So if we're looking at, I don't know, getting wider engagement with a new leadership program that you're rolling out in three months time, there's, there's multiple different KPIs or metrics that I would look at. Some are focused on the learning, the effectiveness or efficacy of the learning itself, i.e. open rates, clicks on links, visits to the website or your learning platform or the location that you're trying to send people to, interactions with your social posts maybe, ways that you can measure and monitor over time, is there an increase in activity with my marketing communications efforts? And then the converse of that is actually, is there an increased activity with your learning? is that actually meaningful and it, you know wider bigger lens outlook which again we're not very great at is you know how does this actually relate to the business what what is the impact of the learning undertaken and has that actually has that actually had any value to the business at the bottom line so i guess it's kind of like a threefold thing of which marketing plays a role in all and if I can add from a, from a, a learning and development perspective, and it really ties in nicely with what you just said there, Ashley, is uh, develop learning and development solutions that solve your organization's problems. Um, learning and development has been trying to solve the, the, the generic management and leadership um, conundrum for decades uh, and has largely failed. Uh, so, uh, and again, part of the problem is that we're not addressing the problems that our managers and leaders actually face uh, within our organizations. And so if you understand those problems, you understand that they are problems, then your key indicators could be that those problems are being addressed and that your indicators are moving in the positive direction. 
Um, I think that, uh, that I've, I've been on far too many courses uh, that have told me about team dynamics, the grow model, uh, all the generic stuff. I mean, we've all been on those courses now. But, but did they actually uh, address the problems within our organizations that they were designed to, apart from uh, we haven't had a management or leadership program here, or it hasn't been refreshed for a while? Uh, again, we need to hold ourselves to account that we won't know if something works if we don't know the problem that it's addressed, uh, that it's been, um, uh, that it needs to actually address. Yeah, and you know, I, I see that a lot as well, where we're we're kind of just heads down taking instruction from the business that you know we've got to, we've got to create something new because the business is demanding it. But I think sometimes we need to push back and we need to feel confident actually asking why. You know, why is this not working? Is is it is it the learning content itself? Is it the learning program, or is is there something else? Is there a root cause issue that isn't? the quality of the learning. In some cases, it may well be, but I don't know if we always have the confidence or the, I don't know, the ability within our organizations to actually challenge the wider wider business in terms of learning that's demanded from us or asked to be created. You know, it's a common issue that, that we see a lot where people are in L&D are creating learning, but they're, they're, they don't even know really why. They're just being told that that's that's what should happen and it's it's kind of a complex one and probably not one for us to unpick here but it is it is a challenge for us to actually build stuff that's meaningful for the business when people who aren't learning professionals are telling us what what we need to create right you are actually there so this isn't the time now but there'll be but the good news for everybody here is that i've just done a three-part special uh, on exactly that for the learning and development podcast with uh, uh with, uh, with key experts so uh, so look out for that he didn't even pay me a fiver to say that, guys. I did, I did. I, <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, what, you, you, you up and I'll knock it out of the park. <laughs> I have listen to that. It sounds great. <laughs> great, amazing. Um, yeah, so, so I think that kind of concludes uh, our discussions um, for today. Thanks so much, Ashley and David. Um, some really, really great conversations there on how to leverage marketing. Um, to boost performance and impact in your organization. So if you want to join more um, conversations like this, just thought I'd mention um, about, about the L&D Collective. So this is our community for L&D professionals. Um, it's just a great opportunity to, to network and share knowledge um, of topics similar to those just discussed today. So I think Marie, Marie's gonna add the link in the chat now um, if you want to take a look and, and consider joining. That'd be absolutely great. Um, and just before we jump into our Q&A as well, so if anyone, if you want to get in touch um, for any further advice or resources, or you want to take a look about how our platforms and services work um, in practice, we'd love to hear from you so you can find the links uh, on screen now. And so, yeah, moving into our Q&A, I can see that we have a lot of questions. So I'll start from the beginning there. Um, so a question from Janet for Ashley, what are some marketing yep. tools we could use to understand uh, our learners? Yeah, so obviously, I, I would I would suggest that the final outcome of understanding your learners is creating personas. Um, and the way that you do that, and we've got podcasts on the Marketing for Learning podcast of how to do that. There's also an ebook I think Marie will share with you guys on how to do this. But really, we need to be looking at collecting as much data as possible on our learners. So ideally a mixture of qualitative and quantitative data. Um, you know, we've seen clients do that in a lot of different ways through kind of, uh, you know, face-to-face -face or virtual sessions and Q&A sessions and, and gathering data that way. We've also seen, you know, surveys or single questions being embedded in the learning platform or learning experiences so that you're getting a, a widespread uh, capture of data over a period of time and you're not asking people to complete like a 10 to 15 question survey all at once you'll get you'll get more answers if you just give them one or two questions or something like that so to my mind you know and there's a lot of free tools out there a lot of our clients have used things like mailchimp um you know actual data capture or survey tools where you can very easily analyze data um because obviously of course the more data you get the more cumbersome it becomes to actually find you know, correlation and causation in that and find meaning within that. And you've got to make sure that you've got the time to be able to do that. But that would be my my strongest advice is, you know, really starting to consider how to build out personas beyond job titles. 
and focus on understanding people's emotional drivers and core challenges that go beyond just learning to actually understand what motivates people, not just to come to work, but, you know, what kind of is also causing them pain. You know, there's a lot of psychology around uh, pain aversion. Humans are pretty much hardwired to, they'll do more to avoid pain than they will to pursue pleasure, basically. So you'll often notice in most marketing, it focuses on pain points or challenges that people have and how a product or a solution solves those problems. That's where we need to get to in in marketing for learning. And the starting point is deeply understanding our audiences through things like personas. Can I add it as well, actually, because you said something earlier that really resonated with me. And I don't wish to be pedantic to the person who's uh, who has asked this question, but the first thing we can do to uh, to understand the people we're seeking to influence is stop calling them learners. Yep. They, I mean, it suggests an innate desire to learn or indeed that they are already learning, which mm. as, as we have rightfully established today, it's not the case. <laughs> So I could not agree more. I have ranted about this at length. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and we've got another question here from Jenny for David. Uh, what are examples of large companies or clients implementing the learning well and uh, makes the best companies with best learning engagement differently? Is it a culture uh, of actually caring about people um, or is it purely analytical? Um, so it is it's a, re, it's a great question I wouldn't I wouldn't like to go into e whether it's either or uh, but there, but it's um, but the analytical part I, I once had um, uh, Sebastian Tyndall on a webinar that uh, me and Guy Wallace did for pivot to performance and um, Sebastian at vitality I'd say is one of the best examples I've ever seen uh, of somebody who has uh, such high engagement because he's actually solving the problems uh, and he does spend an enormous amount of uh, time and energy in analyzing what the real problems are and within that somebody said well that you know your approach seems a bit cold but but in cold it was ruthless in the way that he pursued actual problems probably counter to a lot of ways in which some learning and development people don't necessarily seek to understand the problem but but provide a huge range of solutions that that perhaps bolstered the whole person uh, but but what he was really really clear on is and, and first of all i'd like to say that that by by addressing the actual problems that people face when they're trying to work uh, and you're helping them efficiently and effectively uh, quickly so that they can and so that everybody has the same opportunity to both look good in the current job and improve their prospects in their future job are the primary reasons we're at work they're not they're not the the cold-hearted reasons that 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 businesses uh, perhaps um, look to, to exploit the people it is imagine you were you were able to address or help to employees to address the friction that they were experiencing so that it wasn't down to pure luck whether you had a good line manager or whether you got the culture quicker than any other that it was unpacked for you so that you could do more of the right stuff so i'd say that that he's a great example and uh, you know I've, I've recorded podcasts with him uh, as well as webinars but uh, but others include um uh telia which is a swedish company and uh um uh, Timu and Frederick, who run the learning and development department there, uh, initially uh, increased sales by their, they were, they were um, uh, leading the sales capability team, but they took a very data-driven approach. Uh, and because they actually addressed the friction that people were experiencing, they were then asked to take over learning and development, and they've taken over the same approach uh, there as well. Uh, but that, you know, I've, I speak to so many people on the on the podcast about this. And Tracy Waters, when she was at Sky, talked about a, a very similar approach. Uh, Anne Marie Burbage, uh, who was at Utility Warehouse, uh, these people took um, uh, a very rigorous approach to understanding the analytics. Uh, were brilliant at taking their stakeholders on that journey and then providing their employees with what was actually needed, both in service of them in their jobs that immediately helped the organisation but also in developing careers, which again, improve the prospects of the individuals and help the organization far more than, than uh, they would do using more established top-down um, uh, content uh, providing and, uh, and, and um, 
course delivering. So I'd say that, that those were the, the big ones that, uh, that, that spring to mind. Great, perfect. Uh, thanks, David. And we've got another question from Janet for Ashley. Um, could you give us an example of how to make that connection with the audience besides trying to engage them with their learning needs? Don't talk about their learning needs at all is probably a really good starting point, really. Um, oftentimes when we develop campaigns, you know, David mentioned the funnel earlier, we use that quite a lot. When people are at the top of the funnel and they don't know a huge amount about your learning or your product, you shouldn't really be talking about your product at all. You should be talking about pain points, you should be talking about challenges. So oftentimes our clients are, uh, there's always pushback at this stage when we're building out assets and campaign strategy and we're not really talking about learning per se at that kind of early stage when we're trying to generate buzz, peak interest, just build enthusiasm shouldn't be like, hey, amazing learning waits for you because they don't care. So again, you know, more deeply understanding our audiences on that persona level gives us a really robust springboard to actually develop hooks, taglines, red threads, whatever you want to call them that actually create resonance at that top level when we're trying to generate buzz, raise awareness. Do not focus on learning needs, really only towards, you know, very bottom of the funnel. Once once you've got engaged employees, I think you can have a learning discourse with them. But, you know, when when say 60, 70 percent of your workforce is not engaged with your learning proposition, going hard on on your learning message isn't actually going to do anything at all. And, and uh, talk, if, if I can just um, uh, add you know, an, an L and D leader lens within that, because I completely agree that that back in the old days, you might just be alerting people to what learning content you had. But these days, I mean, again, if you, if you gave the um, uh, the the learning and development role to a marketer, they'd probably use HubSpot and its integrations, so that it wasn't marketing the stuff. It was actually when people were promoted or when they switched jobs, when something happened to their status and so they began a transition, you'd be guiding and supporting them to do more of the right stuff. So it wouldn't be just saying, hey, here's some stuff, but it will be really smartly begin popping them into the funnel to guide them through. Um, I think that, that, that um, I think it was Elliot Maisie who said on Bob Mosier's podcast once, the learning and development of, of um, confused their role with publishers you know, we're not about making stuff available. We're about actually equipping people with what they need to make a demonstrable and planned difference to the work they're expected to do. And just flagging stuff won't work. I've been in organizations yeah. where, you know, we, we, we developed a, um, a campaigns engine in Loop. Uh, and so when we were, we were um, introducing that with customers, well, I remember one customer say, oh no, we've tried that. We've got another vendor who uses newsletters we go, no, 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 this, this isn't a newsletter. This is integrated. This is, this is helping people and giving them exactly what they need based on analysis, uh, data and evidence, which is the data that there's a problem and the evidence of the people who are expected to perform but aren't able to. And it's highly contextual to what it is they're expected to do. And then this is designed for them to do that thing. It only works if they do that thing. And so, so that's how it's very different because, because of course the newsletters didn't work. It's just a great big general FYI. And I'm afraid today's world, um, you know, I, I think the, the age of FYI has got to be gone. It is. I mean, I see newsletters. I, I, I know I'm doing this because they are like this sometimes. I've been sent yeah. newsletters and I don't know how you're expected to find. No one's going to look at it. And even yeah. if they do, they're not going to find anything of value in there. You know, I, we need to be... This is why when, like I saw Jenny, was it Jenny's or Janine's question uh, about, oh, Jenny's question about consistency and when's too much, right? The reality is not everyone sees every single piece of comms that you put out. So these things need to be short to the point, succinct, accessible, because, you know, I mean, we have, we have a mailing list that people subscribe to, right? They, they say, yes, please email me. I want to hear from you. What are average open, open rates in B2B? Like 18 to 23%, something like that. Mm -hmm. So on average, about a fifth of our audience is ever going to see, and they're going to be lower for internal because everyone's getting way too many emails. But let's just say for argument's sake, a fifth of people who get anything open it 
how many of them are going to click, et cetera. So this is why it may, if you ever looked at like a campaign and there was like, a, you looked at everything that was laid out that you were going to put out for a six month period, it'll look like a lot, but not, no one's going to see every single thing that's put out in front of you. And so, you know, I, I think that we need to be mindful of the fact that actually it isn't just about noise, 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 being as much as in people's faces as possible. As I've said about the learning, it needs to be relevant. It needs to be appropriate. It needs to be positioned right. It doesn't always need to talk specifically about learning and signposting learning. I think that's a really long-standing, old-school compliance mindset, where you know we're very much you got to go do this, and we've then again adopted that mentality and that approach in our wider learning proposition. And, and you know, people know they've got to go do compliance. They don't have to go and do anything else from a learning perspective. We can't use the same tactics that we get them to do their compliance for the rest of learning, right? So I think that that's a really important differentiation for us, at least in our, our minds. Absolutely. And uh, I think we've got a couple more questions here, but unfortunately we've run out of time. Um, so we will definitely follow up with those questions. I think Jenny, you had a couple there. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll get, we'll get in touch with you with your, with the answers to your questions there. Um, so yeah, we we'll hope we've kind of found these discussions useful. I certainly have, um, and you'll look for ways to kind of apply, um, these pointers in your organization. So just a reminder as well, that once the session has finished, um, you're going to receive some links to watch it back anytime, share with colleagues. Um, and obviously we encourage you to do so. There's also a post event survey that's going to pop up. So we'd really appreciate your feedback um, on the event there. And so, yeah, I'd just like to say thanks to our speakers, David and Ashley. Uh, it's really great conversations. It, it was great to have you both on. Um, thanks for attending, everyone. And uh, yeah, hope, hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>